And good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to our Week in Review. This, this is week four, and this week we're looking at chapters seven and eight. So let's take chapter seven first. And these are sociological mainstreams, or rather sociological mainstream theories. And we begin our look at sociological mainstream theories by looking at Durkheim's anime theory. And Durkheim postulated that social changes and the feeling of normlessness in society were linked to crime. He linked this because at, in Durkheim's world at the time, there was a movement from, from the farm to the city as, more, as industrialization, uh, rather industrialization expanded throughout France. And so Durkheim believed that this feeling of normlessness due to not know, to having your entire life disrupted resulted in crime. Now Martin expanded on this through strain theory and stated that crime occurred because of discrepancies between social goals and the means to achieve them. In other words, if if society says you should be doing this thing and you're and you're doing thing A rather and, and you can't do it then crime will occur. Agnew took this a step further by developing what he called general strain theory. And this is where he states that anger or frustration results in results from negative relations and experiences while pursuing the American dream. Now we continue to look at other sociological mainstream theories by discussing social process theory. And social process theory are those theories that emphasize the idea that criminality is a learned or culturally transmitted process. Social process theory includes social disorganization theory that's, that was espoused by Sean McKay, routine activities theory Conan, espoused by Conan Felsen, theory of differential association espoused by Sutherland, Theory of Differential Reinforcement, which comes from Akers and Burgess. Focal Concerns Theory, that comes from Miller. Delinquency and Drift, which comes from Matza. And the Techniques of Neutralization, which comes to us by way of Sykes and Matza. Now, following those theories, we also looked at things such as social control theories. And this is the idea that society exerts some form of control or socialization on the person and if that control fails crime will occur and this is where we think find things such as containment theory uh which is espoused by of all name of all people reckless yes that is his name social bond theory comes to us from travis hershey and my personal favorite general the general theory of crime which comes to us by way of Gofferson and hershey and I'll expand on this just a little bit. Uh, so the general theory of crime espoused by Gofferson and Hershey was that it resulted from a lack of self-control that was learned in, child, in, not necessarily childbirth, but learned during childbearing. And this theory espouses that if the child hasn't learned by age eight, uh, the discipline and the ability to control themselves, it's never going to happen. And then of course you have power control theory by Hagen. That is another form of social control theory. And then last week in uh, chapter seven, we talked about developmental and life course theories. These uh, of course include things such as antisocial potential theory and life course criminality. Now, life course criminality is is interesting because life course criminality is where we get the idea that crime is often a young person's game and that people may age out of crime the, the older they become. It also brings us to a very interesting concept where, where marriage, not cohabitation rather, but marriage is the one thing that will guarantee that a delinquent will not or a young criminal will straighten out and we'll see where and sometimes it happens that way 
So, chapter 7 later ends up with discussing various theorists, theory and policy connections related to these mainstream social theories. So, with that, I'm going to skip right down to some of the previously discussed uh, theory driving or theory policy connections. Now, if you look at some of these various theory policy connections, the war on, prover on poverty, the, the, the entire food stamp program, the welfare program, the ADC program, and so forth, is actually based upon some of Durkheim's uh, anime and strain theories. And the idea is, if people have greater opportunities through education, through uh, basic sustenance programs and so forth, they are less likely to go to crime. Social control, of course, deals with things such as strengthening families. And this is where we see things such as child protective services, child welfare services, and so forth. In fact, many delinquency programs often require the parents to get involved as well. The parents have to go through parenting classes while the child is going through some form of uh, some form of treatment out of his home. With that, that takes care of Chapter 7 and the various mainstream sociological act, act, or rather theories. So let's take a look at Chapter 8. Now, in this chapter, we talk about what, what our author likes to call critical theories and integrated theories. And what do I mean by integrated or critical theories? It, the critical theory basically looks at crime as a criticism of how society is today. And some of those, of course, include labeling theory, conflict theory, feminist criminology theory, uh, postmodernism, radical theory, radical Marxist theory, and so forth. And those basically say that crime is a natural occurrence of our society. So the, let's take, for example, labeling theory. Labeling theory tells us that, that people will eventually, or, or delinquents, as is previously postulated, that criminality and delinquency are a result of society calling someone delinquent or criminal. And all this person is doing is merely living up to their label. We'll talk about how that affects policy in, in a few minutes. And of course, you can't look at labeling theory without looking at things such as primary versus secondary deviance. Primary deviance, of course, is what you did to get the label, and the secondary deviance is what you've done after that label has been applied. So, a number of theories in this chapter also discuss how the state and politicians and capitalism create a culture of conflict. And so, crime is is defined as the lower class merely trying to even the playing field. So that's another, that's another way of looking at critical or radical theories, and several fit this fit this bill. Uh, Marxism, for example, uh, cons is considered to be a critical theory. Feminist theory says that says that. Uh, Women are merely committing crime because now they have the opportunity to do so. They're doing it to protest the idea of being, of being uh, stuck as the domestic person in the house and so forth. So now they're going to go out and venture forth and commit crime. So with that, let's take a look at some of the policy decisions that have come about as a result of this, of this sort of behavior. Labeling theory. Now, our our authors tell us that labeling theory has resulted in the in in two uh, historical events. One is prohibition, which is 
gone away. And the other is the war on drugs. And I don't really believe that's a that's an adequate comparison. What is better to look at is the juvenile justice system. The juvenile justice system revolves entirely around labeling theory. If you look at the juvenile justice system, if a police officer decides to pursue formal charges against a, a juvenile, he doesn't seek a warrant. Instead, he seeks a petition and requests for action. If the child is apprehended by law enforcement as a result of a court order, it's not an arrest warrant. Instead, it is a pickup order. If the child is goes to court, he is not. It is not a criminal trial. Rather, it is an adjudication. When the case, when the when a verdict is returned, it is not a criminal verdict, but rather a disposition. And when the child ends up being securely detained, it, it the child is obtaining residential treatment. You kind of get the idea. The idea is to is to not dissociate crime and stigma, and therefore having having the child go on to commit secondary deviance. Some other examples that our that our author uh, looks at, and I don't particularly agree with a lot of them. Conflict theory. Our authors tell us that that conflict theory is interpreted in our policy by non-enforcement of white-collar crime. And if you've looked at the, at the criminal prosecutions, especially in these in the media folder that I've that I've put out for you this week, it's club fed is a thing of the past. Now, we start to see uh, feminist criminology we are seeing, again, greater female presence in crime. Now, if you look at it, though, what crimes are women really committing? They're committing frauds, forgeries, identity thefts, crimes that actually women are just better suited to do. You don't see a lot of women stick-up artists. You don't see a lot of, of women serial murderers, although... Uh, Although there, there's always one that proves it, uh, so you're not. So you, what women are really doing is, they're getting involved more and more in fraud, and we're starting to see more, more attention paid to it because it's getting it's getting prosecuted more. There are more, and there are more women who are actually going to jail and prison as a result. It used to be that women would would almost never go to jail. And the last thing any court wanted to do was to find a woman guilty. And if they did, it was she was usually placed on some kind of supervised release program. And so <clears throat> these are some of the more legitimate examples of critical criminology and how they've allegedly affected uh, social policy today. With that, remember, week seven and eight, be sure to do your reading assignments. And I've left a number of videos that explain a number of terms in, in the and a number of concepts in the week seven, eight folder, for, or rather the uh, media folder. So be sure to take a look at that if you have a spare moment. With that, good luck. Uh, don't forget to get your assignments in on time, and we will see you next week.